Okay, so I've actually been sitting on this vlog for, I don't know, probably six or seven months. It was one of the first vlogs I was planning to do when I started my channel, but a little thing called moving for graduate school, even though it's all online anyway, got in the way and I wasn't able to film the video as quickly as I wanted, but I think that this is a much more apt time to film this particular video, as I think you'll see. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about what's widely known as the first young adult book ever written. Now I know what you're thinking. We're not talking about this or this. We're talking about this. I am willing to bet that most of you have not heard of this book because the only reason I really know about it is that my mom read it when she was... I was gonna say about my age but then I realized that I'm not 13 anymore. I don't know when that happened. But she read it when she was like, I don't know, 13 or 14 and so she gave it to me for Christmas one year when I was about that age and I read it. But I've never really heard anyone talk about it. I don't see it very often in bookstores. The only people I know who have read it are people who are around my mom's age, which I'm not. So most of my friends aren't either. Shocker. But I reread this recently and I was actually very interested in it as kind of like a period piece in a way as a historical artifact rather than a book. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think this book is similar to young adult literature of today, how it might be a little bit different, and the different issues that it covers in the book. Also I think I might put a picture up next to me because I really don't want to hold up that book for however long I'm going to be talking, so editor me, get on that. Seventeenth Summer was written when the author Maureen Daly was only 21 years old, Although that's actually when it was published, she was definitely even younger when she wrote it. She was born in 1921? Either 1921? 22? It was the early 20s. Women can vote, but like, barely. When Maureen Daly was only 15, she submitted a short story she wrote called 15 to a contest that Scholastic was holding for short stories for teenagers, and she actually placed third. And then the following year, she wrote another story called 16, which one? I kind of think you can see where this is going. 17th Summer was part of a contest for novels and it won that contest and entered the publishing process not long after. The year it was released was 1942 and at that time the young adult genre really hadn't solidified yet. There were children's books and there were adult books but there really weren't books for teens. This is also about 10 years before the publication of The Catcher in the Rye by the way which is another book that a lot of people will call the first young adult book. But the genre itself didn't come together until the 60s, so The Catcher in the Rye actually wasn't even part of the young adult genre yet either. It was also a forerunner similar to 17th Summer. Interestingly, Maureen Daly did not write any more novels for about 40 or 50 years. She was a little bit busy because her father died and her family needed some money, so she started working as a journalist. Quite successfully, actually, she was working for the Chicago Tribune, the Saturday Evening Post, and a couple of other places, and she had a pretty successful advice column. And then in the 80s, when her husband and daughter died of cancer within a year of each other, yikes, she did start writing again. But her other books were never quite as well known and beloved as her first one. God, that must have sucked to be known for the rest of your life for something you did when you were 18 and then nothing after that gets the same recognition. Maybe I should apologize to Mary Shelley for how much I complained about Frankenstein. Eh, that's a subject for another day. So anyway, 17th Summer, although it was technically a book for adults, it was about teenagers and a lot of teenagers read it. A lot of older adults were not super into the fact that this book mentions drinking and smoking and sex, as if teenagers have no idea what anything of these things are and they have never done them. No, never, never. Honestly, by today's standards, the mentions of these things are quite light in nature, but by the standards of back then, probably not so much. Plot-wise, this book is pretty simple. It's the story of a teenage girl, 17 to be exact, her name is Angie, and she's never really been on dates, never really been out with guys, doesn't think that that's gonna be for her anytime soon. She's focusing on going to college. And then one day after graduation, she meets Jack, the cool guy in town, at the drugstore after school, and then they start going out. And it goes pretty well, I'd say. Before I get into a deeper discussion of this book, I just want to quickly mention that Maureen Daly based Angie's family a little bit off of her own, uh, especially the sisters. She had three sisters, two older and one younger, and all four of them became extremely successful writers, executives, 
uh, just general business people. They actually had an article written about them in Time Magazine, and if I can find that, I will link that in the description. Angie is based off of Maureen and Lorraine, her older sister, the second in, in order is based off of her sister Kay. I won't be talking much about Margaret, Angie's oldest sister, and Kitty, her youngest sister, because they really don't do much in the book. Margaret's basically there to be pretty and perfect and happy, and so there she will stay. We may, we may reference her later, but she really doesn't do much in the book. And Kitty, who's only 10, is there to be cute or annoying depending on what the plot requires, and therefore she will not get much mention from me either. First off, I want to talk a little bit about the way that this book reads now to a modern audience, at least to a modern-ish me. I was really surprised rereading this as a semi kind of adult, how young it reads compared to YA books of today. I'll just read the first page for you so you get an idea of what I mean. I don't know just why I'm telling you all this. Maybe you'll think I'm being silly, but I'm not really because this is important. You see, it was different. It wasn't just because it was Jack and I either. It was something much more than that. It wasn't as it's written in magazine stories or as in morning radio serials where the boy's family always tease him about liking a girl and he gets embarrassed and stutters. And it wasn't silly, like sometimes when girls sit in school and write a fellow's name all over the margin of their papers. I never even wrote Jack's name at all until I sent him a postcard that weekend I went up to Minocqua. And it wasn't puppy love or infatuation or love at first sight or anything that people always talk about and laugh. Maybe you don't know just what I mean. I can't really explain it. It's so hard to put into words, but, well, it was just something I'd never felt before. Something I'd never even known. Just the childishness and the innocence of that really struck me. I think that sounds much more like a 13 or 14 year old of today than a 17 year old. I was about 13 when I first read this, so I don't think it necessarily struck me as that odd, but looking at it now, I'm just like, how old is this girl? Should she be going out this late? I'm a little concerned. It's kind of got that, oh good golly gosh, sort of energy that was very popular in the 1940s. I don't think this was necessarily uncommon during this time period, especially in books for girls. They often tried to make women seem more innocent and childish than they might have actually been in real life. Angie's innocence is something that comes up repeatedly throughout the book in a very interesting way. Angie has not had any experience at all with romance, with boys, with dates. Her sisters have had some. Uh, her parents actually do not want her going out very much. They want her to focus on her education, which is quite unusual for a young woman in the early 40s, I think. But throughout the book, when she's hanging out with Jack and his friends, it's always kind of understood that she's like the sweet, innocent one that kind of needs to be protected. So in a way, this is sort of the forerunner of not being like other girls, although I think in a kind of a different way than YA usually displays today. Usually people aren't like other girls because they don't like makeup or they don't like doing their hair or they read books because apparently only two girls at any one school can read books and one of them can only read like romance novels or something, I don't know. But oftentimes they're not innocent to the degree that Angie is and I think partly that's because of the internet, you could just look up that stuff now. There's this kind of funny scene where Angie goes on a date with another guy whose name is Tony. I think Jack's out of town and she is, has just started dating him and she wants to try to date other guys too. So she goes out with Tony, she has a good time, she likes him, she thinks things are going well, and then he says this to her. He said in his same warm voice, are you cold, Angie? I was surprised. It wasn't a cold night. Why no, no thank you, Tony. I'm quite comfortable. And besides, I've got my sweater right in the back seat. He looked at me and then laughed hard, slapping his hand on my knee. He laughed so hard that I, but I laughed too and settled back on the car cushions, reassured. It's never quite explicitly stated that Tony may have been after something besides keeping Angie warm on a cold night, but we're given to understand later in the book that Tony is the kind of guy who takes girls out and maybe wants to keep them warm on a cold night, if you know what I mean. This is something that you kind of that you often see in older books um, <clears throat> written before this era as well that men are attracted to innocence, that they want somebody who's unspoiled by the world and doesn't care about earthly things and, you know, all of that Anne of Green Gables little women kind of stuff. And the girls who do know about the world and who 
are more knowledgeable about adult things like sex are somewhat less desirable or at least less interesting. However, this doesn't seem to be the case with men necessarily. We have an interesting thing going on with the men in this book too. It's not quite the not like other guys sort of thing, but there is an emphasis on masculinity and sort of that ability to physically do like masculine things that's seen as desirable. And men who aren't like that are really looked down upon. There's this interesting scene where Angie and Jack are at the carnival with another couple that have been going out for a long time. And the guy in that couple, whose name is Fitz, wants to win a toy for his girlfriend at a carnival game by like throwing balls. And he can't do it because he sucks at it. Also, the game is probably rigged, but whatever. His girlfriend is really upset that Jack can win something for Angie, but her boyfriend can't win something for her. She also tells Angie in confidence that she hasn't really been into him ever since they were hanging out at a playground one night and they got on the little merry-go-round that goes around like this and he got dizzy and had to get off. And for some reason, him being a human is unattractive to her. So there's this idea that men need to be like in control and they need to be suave and like know what to do all the time. And when they show vulnerability in the way that Fitz does, women don't really like that. Or at least the woman that Fitz is with doesn't really like that. And Jack is sort of this counterpart in that he's athletic, he's popular, he can win the ball games, he drives. And that scene is like what a guy is supposed to be. Ironically, the longer you're in a relationship with someone, the more likely you are to realize that they do in fact have vulnerabilities and they're not going to be good at everything that you think a guy or a girl should be good at. People aren't ideals, they are people, so they're going to fail at things. That doesn't make them a bad person. But hey, they're 17, so whatever. By the way, little mini rant here. This book is called 17th Summer, but Angie's already 17 when she's in it. Doesn't that make it the 18th summer? I gotta move on. This also leads in a little bit to kind of the B story in this book. Remember when I talked about Angie's sister Lorraine and how she was going to come back later in this video? Well, here it is. Lorraine it has been at college for two years. She's studying English. She's very intellectual. She's read a lot of really hip books. She goes out on dates with guys sometimes, but never really seriously with one guy. And now that she's home for the summer, she really, she wants to find somebody who shares her intellectual interests, but there just isn't a lot of that in this small Wisconsin town that they live in. But a friend of a friend connects her with this guy named Martin, who is a college graduate who seems to share a lot of her interests. They go on a couple of dates. She finds him really smart and interesting and just a man of the world. And then he starts to show his true colors, which are beige because I hate beige because Martin sucks. He calls her at the last minute for dates, he stands her up, he acts uninterested when they're together, but she sort of can't get over him because he's the closest thing to what she wants that she's encountered and she just doesn't want to let go of that. So throughout the book you see Lorraine putting in a lot of effort into this relationship, really wanting to be with Martin all the time, getting him gifts, trying to figure out what his interests are and Martin is just not showing her the same level of interest and it's honestly really sad to see. I think a lot of the people in Lorraine's family kind of think that maybe she should be dating somebody who actually pays attention to her and oh why doesn't she date one of the nice boys in town and I do sympathize with that. You should date somebody who pays attention to you but at the same time I sympathize with Lorraine a little bit. I think that you shouldn't settle for somebody who isn't interested in the same things that you're interested in or at least doesn't want to learn about the things that are important to you. So I think Lorraine deserves both. She deserves somebody who can have a conversation with her about the things that she likes and also somebody who will, you know, treat her like she's not garbage. I honestly feel that if this book were written today, if it were like more of a literary fiction style novel for adults, I think Lorraine would be the main character. I think that this would be a coming of age story about Lorraine. However, one quick note before we move on from Lorraine, I just want everybody to know that Kay, who was, who's Lorraine's real life counterpart, was a top marketing executive for Revlon. She came up with several advertising campaigns that are well known today even. And she was married twice, but it seems her second marriage was fairly happy and they were married until she died. At one point, Angie says, I wish I could have said something to Lorraine about Martin. Her whole life might have been different. That's, an, that's actually a quote. Her whole life might have been different. But honestly, I think K won. 
So Lorraine probably wins too. I don't think we need to worry about Lorraine. Now we're going to get into what I think is the most interesting part of this book, and that is how it deals with some social issues. I was looking through to see if there were any non-white characters, like, at all, and I did find a mention of a Black pianist at a bar. Jack and Angie go out to a bar one night because I think they live in a time when 18-year-olds can legally drink so they can get into bars, and they happen to see a Black pianist, although in the book he's described as a colored pianist because that was the language at the time, and they really enjoy his performance and he's well known throughout the community for being very good. However, there's one mention of his appearance that I found very interesting, so I'm going to share it with you. Look, Jack, I remember saying, and the thought first puzzled and then amazed me. He has red nail polish on. Isn't that funny for a man? Yeah, he answered laconically, playing with his beer glass. It's pretty funny. It struck me as so amazing that I wanted to talk about it, but Jack looked the other way, and that was all he said. Was that... Was that queer coding? Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. This is another thing that like never comes up again in the book, but a lot of old people were very shocked and dismayed by. The book, however, is very explicit in its treatment and its discussion of economics and social class. I'm pretty sure the book takes place in the late 30s, even though it was published in the 40s, because it did take a few years to get published, and also there's no mention whatsoever of World War II, which I'm 100% sure would not have happened if the book was supposed to take place in the 40s. So my guess is like late 30s. So we're still in the Great Depression. It's not quite like the worst part of the Great Depression, but it's still a situation that people are going through. However, Angie's family is portrayed as quite well off. They're not rich rich, but they're definitely upper middle class. They have fancy dinners. They can afford to send children to college, even if they're women, and all of the girls are encouraged to go to college. It seems like they live in a nice house. Angie talks sometimes about the work connections that her father has. He knows some important people in the town. The two oldest sisters do have jobs over the summer, but it's portrayed as more something to do while you sit around rather than, oh, you have to work so we can feed our starving family. Jack's family is a little bit different. They definitely aren't poor, but they're more like successful working class. Jack's family owns a bakery in town, and they actually mention in the story, this is kind of a major plot point, that the family's from Oklahoma and that they are going to move back soon because the bakery is not doing very well. Most people in town bake their own baked goods, and so in order to earn a livelihood, they have to go somewhere else. As a result, although Jack has good manners and he is a, like a nice, well-brought-up person, he doesn't necessarily know what to do with the fancy dinners and all the different silverware that Angie's family has, which leads to some trouble when he comes over to the house for dinner. Lorraine kind of starts it off on the wrong foot because she wants to make herself seem smart, so she starts talking about all these books that she knows Jack hasn't read, but then that really rattles him, and so he starts to get very clumsy. Each fork full of food seemed to be a separate problem to him. I saw him look at each piece of roast pork, lift it a little from his plate, as if he were wondering whether or not he could make it, and then raise it quickly to his mouth with a, with a jerky forward movement of his body. He was so scared that someone would start to talk to him again that he ate too fast and kept his eyes glued to his plate in apprehension. Once my mother asked if he would care to help himself to more buttered peas, and he stopped eating suddenly and looked at her with a startled, ma'am? And she really wants to help Jack, but she just isn't sure how to do it, and she's almost a little bit embarrassed that he doesn't know how to behave. Although the fact that they come from different backgrounds isn't- here. Hello? What? It's time. It's time to what? What do you do? You, you, you usually do this time of night. Well, it's a little bit early, but can I have five minutes? Okay, if there's nothing left. <laughs> The fact that they come from different backgrounds isn't necessarily a hindrance to them being together, but the fact that they're headed in different directions is. Jack isn't super interested in school or going to college. He was an okay student, it's implied, but what he really wants to do is kind of more physical work that makes him feel like he is sort of contributing in this very concrete way. 
He talks about wanting to do manual labor, working on a farm. That's the kind of work he really likes. And Angie is supportive of this. She understands what he means. Overall, she wants him to do what he wants to do, but in the end, what she wants is very different. Angie wants to go to college. She isn't sure what she wants to study and she isn't sure like what's going to happen after that, but she's very interested in learning. She always wants to learn new things. She wants to read. She wants to figure out as much as she can about the world, explore new places, and Jack just doesn't have that that desire. That coupled with the fact that his family is moving to Oklahoma is going to make it really hard for them to keep up a relationship because she's going to college in Chicago. And back then it was even harder to do long distance because they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have email, you had to send letters, physically like take trains to see people. It was pretty tough. That dynamic is ultimately why their relationship probably isn't going to work. At the very end of the book, he does see her off to college and he says he's going to try to write and come to see her, but you're left with this idea that it's just probably not going to happen. And although that's realistic, I feel like that's something I haven't seen a lot in at least the young adult books that I've read. There's always like, oh, and at the end of the day, this miracle happened and he transferred to the same college as her, so now they get to be together. Or oftentimes the, the book will just end right before that moment actually happens. Newer YA, I think, is starting to take the realistic route a bit more, but I think it's really striking how romantic and optimistic and yet at the same time, how realistic this book really is. As I said, I am a lot more interested in this book as like a snapshot of what was going on in the world at that time and what literature was doing at that time than as a book itself. Although I, it is important to me because my mom read it as a kid. I, it's not a favorite of mine. However, I do recognize why it has meant a lot to so many people. And I think that it is an interesting read, especially if you like YA. So I would recommend it for people who might want a slower paced YA because it is definitely slow and it's a fairly long book and something that has an old fashioned feel but is a bit more realistic. Thank you all for listening to me ramble as always and I hope you have a good day, night, week, whatever period of time you are currently in, I guess. Bye.